In the last video, we looked at the Max 32660, Maxim's smallest, least expensive, full-powered ARM Cortex M4-based microcontroller. Even though it's small, it's powerful. It contains a complete set of peripheral components and lots of RAM and flash to power through complex algorithms. Well, today we're going to take a look at software development for the Max 32660. First, let's talk about the development environment. For today's video, we're going to focus exclusively on Eclipse. Why? Well, Eclipse has two big things going for it. First, it's a full-featured development environment with the project management and debug features that you expect from a modern IDE. And second, it costs nothing to download and use. Now, if you've never used Eclipse before, you should go to this web address and download the installation package right now. When you install Eclipse, be sure to check the box to include support for the Max32660. But chances are, if you're watching this video, you've already installed Eclipse for Maxim microcontrollers. Well, if that's the case, you need to open the maintenance tool included in your Eclipse installation directory. When you do, you'll be presented with three options. Select the Package Manager. In the Package Manager, you'll see a list of all currently supported Maxim microcontrollers, and, and this list is always expanding to include the very newest Maxim parts. Select the Max32660, and then click Continue. Follow the on-screen prompts to install the support files and the example programs for the 660, and then exit the maintenance tool. Now, once you've installed the Max32660 support, or if you're new to Eclipse after you've installed the IDE, you're ready to launch Eclipse. As a rule, when I start working with a new microcontroller, I like to create a new workspace. To do this, click the Browse button and create a new directory in the Workspace folder. Choose that directory and open Eclipse. Now, right-click in the Project Explorer and select Import. Open the General category and choose Existing Projects into Workspace. All of the existing sample programs are delivered as pre-configured Eclipse projects and they're ready to run. Next, browse to the Eclipse installation directory, then choose Firmware, then Max32660, then Applications, and then finally, Click on EVKit Examples, and then Open. On the next screen, be sure to check Copy Projects into Workspace. That option ensures that when you change the code in the examples, the changes will be saved to a local copy and not to the master copy in the installation directory. Everything else you can ignore. Just click Finish, and you're done. Now let's turn our attention to the hardware. The evaluation kit for the Max32660 looks like this. A tiny board that honestly doesn't look like much, an 18-pin, 500-mil dip with a red LED, a push button, and a serial wired debug connector. But remember, the Max32660 is a real system on chip, and it has lots of peripherals, and those peripherals are exposed on 14 of the 18 pins. The other four pins are there for ground, I.O. and core supplies, and reset. In the EV kit package, we include a Max32660 debugger board. It's pre-programmed with Daplink software that converts debug and loader commands to the bit sequences needed for the serial wire debug protocol that the Max32660 board requires. To use the Max32660 EV kit, connect the debugger board to the EV kit board using the supplied SWD cable, and then Connect the debugger board to your development PC using a micro USB cable. On the PC, you'll see the debugger board identify as a new disk drive called Daplink. Now you're ready to compile and debug a program. Let's start with a Hello World program. Click on the triangle next to Hello World in the Project Explorer, then double click on main.c. That will open main in the editor window, and here, you can review the code and make changes if you like. To the right is the program outline. You can use it to open any of the include files named in the main program. 
and this is a good way to learn the ins and outs of the Maxim board support packages. You can trace the references through the include files, and then look at the source files for the various device and peripheral subsystems as needed. Well, for now, let's just compile the program. First, right-click on the project name and choose Clean Project. This removes any leftover files from previous builds. You don't need to do this every time, but it's a good idea the first time you compile a project to clean the build directory. Next, select Build Project from the context menu. Now, this will take a little time. After all, you're building all the files related to the project, including the peripheral drivers. But once the process completes, you'll have an ELF file ready to load and run. Now, to load and run the compiled program, just click the arrow next to the bug in the icon bar and choose Debug Configurations. On the left, you'll see several debug configuration categories. Most of these are specific to projects that live natively in Eclipse, but the sample programs Maxim delivers rely on the GNU debugger, GDB, and OpenOCD. When you open the triangle next to GDB Open OCD Debugging, you'll see all the current projects listed. Select Hello World and then click Debug. That will load the executable onto the target and run the C startup code on the target. Once the C startup code is executed, the system will stop at the first line of user code. This is a good place for us to pause just a moment and look around at the debug environment. The first thing you'll notice is the source code in the larger window to the left. You can see that the opening brace in the source window is highlighted. That's where the processor is halted. Just above the source code window is the debug window, and that tells you that the processor is in a suspended state in the main module. To the right are the active breakpoints, just the one for now, and below that is the disassembly. Now, you're going to notice something right away in the disassembly window. Each source line may be represented more than once in the disassembly. That's because the compiler optimizes the machine code. If it makes sense from a code size or execution speed standpoint to break a line into multiple code sections, the compiler is going to do just that. So, don't be surprised when stepping through the assembly code to see the highlight jump around in the source window. Now it's time to run the program. Click the play button in the icon bar and the program will resume from where it stopped and that's the opening brace in main. You'll see the red LED begin blinking once per second and if you open a terminal window and point it at the CMSYS DAP port, you'll see an incrementing count, updating once per second. In the Eclipse window, you won't see much. As long as the program is running, it's not going to update the debugger unless it hits a breakpoint. But we can stop the program by clicking the pause button in the icon bar. Now when you do this, Eclipse sends a break command to the Max32660. This halts execution immediately, most likely in one of the two timer wait loops that are called from main. Now, once again, it's helpful to pause here to just get our bearings. The source code for the timer handler is in the source window, and we can see the disassembly immediately to the right. Above the source window is the call tree, and below the source window is the console. The message on the console tells us that a SIGINT event occurred, and that event, which was generated when I clicked the pause button, caused the breakpoint. Now we can set a new breakpoint and see how to debug a running program. Let's reopen the main program and set a breakpoint at the LED online. Now when we click the resume button, execution stops before the program turns on the LED. Okay, this is a good time to take a look at the board schematic. This board is actually a pretty simple affair, with the MAX32660 at the heart of the schematic, but we want to focus on the LED. The LED is controlled by an external in-channel MOSFET. The gate of the MOSFET is connected to port bit 13, so when bit 13 is high, the MOSFET is on and current flows through the LED. But when bit 13 is low, 
the MOSFET is turned off, and so is the LED. But how, in code, is the port bit controlled? Well, we'll start by taking a look at main, but sadly, we really don't find much help here. There is a function called LED on, and it takes an index variable that represents which LED we want to turn on, but the operation of that function is kind of opaque. The EV kit has just one LED, so this index value is always going to be zero for this platform. Wow, it sure would be helpful to take a look behind the curtain and see how the system really works. Well, to do that, all you do is click the Step Into button on the icon bar. This causes execution to proceed into the LED on function and stop right at the first statement of that function. In LED on, we see a runtime assertion that checks to make sure the LED index is in bounds, and then a compile time conditional. LED on is defined as 1 in the board support files, so only the GPIO outset routine will be called. Now let's talk about that for just a moment. As far as we know, nothing has been configured yet. We don't know if the LED port is configured as an input or as an output, or maybe it's a special function. We noted in the last series that every pin is overloaded with one or more special functions. But what we haven't discussed yet is that the Maxim board support package performs a lot of configuration functions before we ever get to the first line of the user program. Now, in particular, the board support package knows that there's an LED attached to port 0, bit 13, and it pre-configures the port bit as an output. Now, of course, you're free to reconfigure that pin as anything you want. The LED will flash with the state of the bit, but it isn't going to affect the performance of the device at all. The LED port definitions are in an array called LED pin. There's one definition for each LED on the board, and since there's only one LED on this board, there's just one entry in the LED pin array. Each entry in the LED pin array has the type GPIO config T, and that's a structure with four elements. The port number, zero in this case, the bit mask for the field, the special function if one is assigned, and the pad type. Is this a regular totem pole output, or is it a pull-up pad, or a pull-down pad? For this pad, the structure contains zero for the port number, and the mask is set to 2000 hex. That sets only bit 13, and that's the bit we want to set. But how? Well, that's the job of the GPIO outset function. That function contains just two lines, a declaration that returns the physical address of the GPIO port, and a line that writes to a physical register in the GPIO peripheral. This register can only set bits in the GPIO output. Any zero bits written to the register are ignored. And since only one bit is set in the argument we pass to the register, only one bit gets turned on, bit 13. Okay, are you still with me? Well, don't give up now, because, honestly, we've dug a lot deeper than we really need to, and, and here's why. The GPIO outset function is part of our standard API set, along with lots of other functions to ease your programming experience. See, you can find out everything you need to know in the include files, in this case, in the gpio.h file. Now, in this file, you'll find the function prototypes for all the things you could possibly do or even want to do with a GPIO subsystem in the MAX32660. All you do is pass a few parameters to the functions, and the APIs will do your bidding. You need go no deeper, as long as you trust the API to do the right thing. And the even better news is that every peripheral in the system has this kind of header file, with enumerations for all possible values of every field in every configuration and status register. If you want to configure and use the real-time clock, a spy port, or a timer, well, you can find their header files in the peripheral driver folder. So, when you're developing for the MAX32660, you can read the user's guide to learn the capabilities of each peripheral, 
but you probably won't need to access those registers directly. Take a look in the header files and find the routines that you need. Chances are very good that you'll be able to do everything you want just using the API functions. And you'll have your application running in no time. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more informative videos that show how to use Maxim's low power microcontrollers.